welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research and advocacy group. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. Before I introduce this week's guest, I'd like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present, and we are grateful for the continuing care of the lands, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. This week, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Anna Lush Smitsman. With a list of professional and academic accomplishments a mile long, Annalusha is well-versed in systemic barriers to change and how to achieve societal transformations. Her PhD dissertation, Into the Heart of Systems Change, is being implemented worldwide for systemic transformation in economics, education, politics and governance through her proposed transition plan for a thrivable civilization. She's here with me today to discuss SDG 16, which focuses on promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, providing access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Welcome, Annalush, and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, (laughs) and thanks for this great introduction. That's okay. Now, I just want to start, because we do try to take this podcast as a very sustainability 101 sort of level, so I just want to start by clarifying some information for our listeners. When we talk about systemic barriers or systemic change, what kind of systems are we talking about? Yeah, it's good that you clarify that from the start. I qualify those as mechanistic systems. So mechanistic systems by design are still coupled to the old classical economic systems of exponential growth. And they don't have the systemic boundaries um, that are necessary for regulating systemic behavior. Therefore, it leads to this exponential growth pattern, which has inbuilt, of course, an exponential collapse because nothing in nature has this growth curve except for viruses and bacteria. However, (laughs) we somehow decided that that's a really good economic growth (laughs) uh, curve. And we've equated that to progress. So these are the kind of systems that by design, create very systemic barriers that also are hindering us in resolving the systemic boundary issues which sustainability is all about. Just to narrow that down a bit further, when we're talking about boundaries, you're talking about hard limits, like how many resources there are in the environment that we can use. Is that what you mean by like boundaries? It's one expression of a boundary. Any system that is interdependent has therefore systemic boundaries that regulate the behavior and the growth patterns of the interconnected elements of a system. Right. So a systemic boundaries can be indeed our planetary boundaries and thresholds, but also social ceilings and systemic boundaries. If you just want to even bring it back to your own body, your own systemic boundary will let you know, now it's time to rest. Now it's time to integrate, or perhaps now it's time to get active. Yeah. On an individual level, your, your whole body is a system. If one thing fails, then the rest can't really continue. Exactly. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> I think that explains, you know, like yeah. what we're talking about in terms of these are the limits before we get collapses in a lot of different areas. So I wanted to ask you about, um, I don't know if you've heard anything about Australian politics, but there's been many complaints lately about government corruption, and we've had quite a strong push for an independent commission against corruption. What kind of tools do regular citizens have to prevent or remove corruption in their governments and institutions? First of all, I want to presence that what is happening in Australia is not unique to Australia. No, this of is, course not. <laughs> we are really in a time where so much corruption is being revealed worldwide. You know, I travel a lot. I just came from Europe. There, it has its own scandals. I'm now calling for Mauritius. Uh, also, corruption is being revealed. So 
this is an ongoing process, of course. Um, so the, the first and most important tool <laughs> is how will you vote for? <laughs> it starts yes, as, course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as, as basic as that. And then, of course, there's all the, the whole the issue of transparency and accountability. The problem with democracies today is it's so far removed from people. There's a lot of people who don't even vote. And then the people that are getting elected, therefore, are getting often elected by the people who really feel passionate about about their person. And the problem also with, of course, democracies, they are pluralistic by design. So there's still so many winners and losers. I think the Australian political system suffers from the same design as well. Now, the other thing, of course, about transparency and revealing the corruption is you need, you need to know, of course, the issues. What is going on? How do I hold my leaders uh, to account with so many bureaucratic processes these days? This is what becomes very, very difficult for citizens to be able to even track that. And then, of course, how to organize and mobilize also uh, beholding to account. You can start, of course, from local governance up to, to higher governance. But the first step is get informed, find out what are the issues, and but also be very careful not to feed into the wrong narrative. At the moment, you know, there, there is so much polarization going on in societies. And I think it's, um, for me, always the best approach is not just only trying to hold people to our account and get information, but also to see what alternative solutions can be proposed. A lot of people feel really disenfranchised by the existing yes. systems, like they feel like no one's listening to them. Here we do have mandatory voting, so we don't have the issue of not everyone voting, which is a good thing, I think, in terms of making sure that everybody has a voice, whether or not they want to. But it doesn't necessarily resolve the issue, I think, which is maybe the greater one, is access to that information and knowledge and understanding of what's happening. So would you say that education is a really key point to resolving some of these issues? It is a key point, but also I think most importantly is the culture. Corruption always takes place in a culture and cultures are grown by people. So what's the culture of, of trade-off? Where are these shortcuts taken? Where are these vested interests nested in? And making that visible. So you, you do need some strong civil society groups that are able then to reveal what are the vested interests that are you know, driving this behavior of corruption and how to let your elected leaders know that that's not okay. I would say education is important, but it's it's the culture again of, of education. And that means from a very early age, encouraging students to have their voice, to raise questions. So just an education, for example, that has a top-down approach uh, that creates more followers is not helpful at all. Actually, that feeds into the culture of corruption. So you, you need really engaged, active, participatory, reflective um, right. you know, learners and, and teachers too. So it's a whole society look. Um, you can't just focus only on, on one institution. It's, and yeah, that's why I'm saying, yeah, uh, mechanistic systems. Yeah. Mechanistic systems are prone to a lot of corruption at the end because they're driven from the top down. Yeah. I think that that's one thing that we get very ingrained in doing things as they've been done without necessarily looking to see if they still are serving our needs. That's something that maybe needs to be better looked at worldwide. It's interesting that you mentioned the the cultural aspect to that education because one of my previous guests actually spoke about homeschooling and a different style of education in which children are granted a lot of agency to self-direct their learning. And I think that that definitely ties really well into what you're saying there. I can see parents at home really struggling with that as well though, because when you've got young ones and you're really busy, it, it can be really hard to stop and have the time to think about how you're affecting your young one's mind view. I homeschooled my oldest son until he was uh, six. With the youngest, that, that was more challenging because of time, because I, I had to work as well. But I also took an active role in their education. So um, I gave a lot of training to the schools. Again, you know, my commitment is always on the one hand, help for the co-creation of the new systems. 
um, that carry a different design principles based on living systems. And secondly, work also within existing institutions to help the transformation that needs to take place there. So as a parent, if you are not able to homeschool your child, but there are still a lot of ways in which you can be engaged in the learning process actively in terms of their homework, uh, take an interest in what they're learning, go to their school and even with parent committees so that you have an active voice there as well. So there are many different ways, um, but the, the involvement in your child's education really starts, first of all, of course, with your relationship. I spent a lot of time with my children also learning uh, in nature, <laughs> and taking them out into the forest, let them develop their own relationship with life. And I think if you give that as a foundation first, again, that cultivates also an attitude and also a sense of confidence for the child that in themselves, and I think this is where the, the relational capacities, the life skills are so incredibly important. We are way too focused on just this knowledge society, not a wisdom society. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot from um, the Australian Aboriginal people when I lived for eight years in Australia. And I really, really respect how their sense of education really starts from the community up first um, and the traditional knowledge you know, so that the land grows you up um, for, for the children to know that um, they're part of this earth, really. They have their own, they have their belonging, they, their, that their identity is, is fundamental uh, and, and based on nature itself. So it's, but education is also about identity. Who am I? What does it mean to be human? Uh, especially now in this difficult and challenging time. Yeah, I can see how taking them out in nature would also help form that understanding of existing within a system as well and seeing you know how it all interrelates. So I can see how that's a very natural way for them to form that understanding and not see things in an isolated view. I often engage in conversations with people and I'll find like just about things like having taxes and, and things like that um, where people will go well I don't use public transport so I don't want my taxes to pay for them. I find that it's really because they're not seeing a direct benefit they don't see how the whole system works and how you know having people who maybe use those public transport to go to other jobs and maybe work at the retail stores that they shop at or you know like there's just so many things that other people are using that also helps them but because it's not direct they don't see it so yeah I can see how having that systemic view would really help people to get that sense of connectedness it's a very good point that you're now raising, you know, and it also brings me another concept in Australia that I really love is custodianship. In America, you call it stewardship. But this aspect of custodianship, this, this caretaking, if you have a welfare society, then how are we all going to contribute to the welfare of us all? Um, but then comes, of course, up the issue of corruption again. So if people are feeling, well, I am willing to contribute those taxes, if there is a fair distribution system, and if they then feel that that's being shortcut <laughs> by other vested interests, then it breaks down, of course, the trust as well. People need to, or children especially, if they start to learn about uh, systems, living systems, and nested interdependencies, and how these interdependencies is a culture of relatedness. And then it's it, they're not having then this technical view of a system, which then again, makes them so removed from the processes. Watch for the pattern that connects, you know. With my kids, that meant when we, you know, when we go shopping, become aware, where does this come from? And how does it come on the table? And if we're buying this, instead of that, what are the consequences? And why are we doing this? Um, there's also a growing movement, for example, of true pricing now. But what's the true cost of a, of a product? What do, what do you mean by true cost of a, a product? 
Well, for example, there's a lot of cheap products on the market that come at a, a huge environmental cost, but also right. social cost. There might have been child labor involved, using resources where there is no regeneration back to the land, to the environment. And so most of our products that are being supplied, there's not a true costing, which is why we're having a whole sustainability problem. But then again, the other problem behind that is if, if we're putting the true costing and true pricing on it, is that it can become extremely expensive for people as well. And then people will complain that's just for, for those who are already very wealthy. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here we can see already that the issues that we are now faced with, sustainability itself is an issue. It's complex. It's hugely complex. You can't just focus on one element. You know, there are so many interdependencies here at play. But coming back to what we're talking about, education and children and for people to understand this interrelatedness uh, is really, really important, especially right now when tough decisions have to be made about how are we going to steward our planet together What's going to be a fair distribution of the resources that are left? There are limits to growth that we are constantly ignoring. So we're going to move in a process where we're going to have to, to contract in some ways yeah. uh, the ways that we've been living. We're already seeing so many crises right now. First, of course, that we came out of the COVID pandemic. Now there is uh, the whole war in Eastern Europe through the invasion of um, in Ukraine by Russia. Yeah. Climate change is, is getting worse. So I think it's important here too that people start to, to understand that we're going to have to pull together with all that we have in order not to collapse. We're coming face to face with our own possible extinction. I think that worldwide there is definitely a strong will towards addressing climate change in particular because we are starting to see some of the consequences of it. Here in Australia, we've had a lot of extreme weather events. Back in 2020, we had the bushfires. Zoonotic diseases are going to become more prevalent. And then we've also had recent um, floodings. I think this year we've had four floods that are supposed to only happen once every 100 years, according to the typical narrative. So it's becoming very clear to a lot of people that this is happening right now and we're having to deal with it. The issue is, I think, that because of the systems that exist, it's hard to find ways to actually address the issues. There's a big question of, okay, what do I do? And, you know, people will get on board things like recycling and they'll hear the messaging and go, okay, well, I recycle. Cool, I've done my bit. And then the, the problem with things like that, the plastic doesn't get Re actually recycled. So I think that there's a lack of trust in the existing systems that were supposed to be addressing these issues and also a feeling of overwhelm basically because there are so many things happening that are so big. What advice would you have to people at home for what they can do to take part? And what you're addressing is, as well as indeed that a lot of this marginal approach it doesn't work. And also want people to understand those people who think, well, it's it's already too far. We've already committed to two degrees, so why should I care? Well, right now we're still having to stop three to four degrees warming, which is even worse. So every little bit creates an escalation event. That's what these what we call tipping points. So we have to avoid with everything we can the worst case scenarios while we haven't even secured to two degree warming. So starting with what you can do yourself, the first step, of course, is know your energy consumption patterns. I measure that uh, at home. So look at your bill, start to see the fluctuations in your bill, find out how you can reduce your energy consumption. If you can go renewable, you can go solar. That of course would be much better. If you go solar as well, look at your appliances. Uh, just some basic stuff, a kettle, for example, an electric kettle, takes a lot more energy than cooking the water. Uh, same with rice cookers, doses. So start to know which appliances use a lot of energy. Look at your lighting as well. So start with your own household. This is important. What are you buying? How much, what transport are you using? How often are you using the plane? I find now that um, a lot of the COVID restrictions are lifted. <laughs> I just came from the Netherlands back to Mauritius. 
It was unbelievable how many people were taking the plane. I, I took the plane as well because I hadn't seen my family in over two years. But I noticed there's no slowing down there. And again, a lot of expectations of people who go to conferences and seminars. Everyone wants to have the in-person meeting again. So it's like a lot of people want to go, go back yeah, to the old system. Yeah, they want to go back days, to yeah? where we were and... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely silly in a lot of ways. I mean, we're meeting right now, we're over Zoom and it's it's perfectly Exactly. Fine. Like, we could go back to reducing a lot of that waste and yeah. we definitely need to learn the lessons. So start at home, uh, but then also if you are active in, in lobbying change, start supporting other renewable solutions to come to the market. You know, we know, of course, in Australia, there's been a huge lobby for the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> and I don't believe that that's just changed overnight. So having the the will to do something about climate change or believing it is necessary doesn't mean that we are anywhere near those actions. But I'm seeing also on an international global leadership level, it's very sad how, to me, there is not yet that that global leadership will to truly do something about it. People are, yes, they, they, they're voicing it in the media, but then if when they're having to make this concrete uh, in real issues, and that also means recol- that they ha- politicians are going to have to take a regulating role as well. Um, but many of them want to be elected again. And yeah. it doesn't make them popular. So they're watering it down. On the one hand, they, it's like they're trying to appease the people who do care about the environment say, yes, we're going to address it, we're going to do something about it. On the other hand, <laughs> they are they also, they don't want people. to. Yeah. And, and many of them, there comes to the corruption again, are also playing into the hands of those with a vested financial interest in the fossil fuel industry. And they're trying to eat from both worlds. And, and I mean, what that they, they should be doing, yeah. I mean, from my perspective, I see that they should be trying to support the, the transitions away from yes. you know, things like fossil fuels and supporting those. I mean, even things like here in Australia, we don't have accessible electric vehicles. The ones that exist are extremely expensive. And we have things like in the, gov- the government in Victoria introduced a tax levy on electric vehicles because it wasn't fair to people who were had other vehicles, like they weren't paying the fuel taxes. So it wasn't, they, they had reduced revenue. And, you know, like it's just <laughs> very backwards kinds of thinking that, um, you know, hinders change. It makes it harder. Exactly. And, and that's a very good example of a very narrow down, old invested interest policy decision, not seeing the bigger picture, not having the courage, you know, to just... And explain very clearly to people, look, we're going to have to regulate this. We're going to have to change this, but also drive investment in these uh, renewable solutions. And from a systemic perspective, there's been far too little. You know, most of uh, capital investment, all of that still goes in the old economic systems. uh, And it's not helping to drive the transition. It's unfortunate that 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 support isn't in place. And we yeah. just got a new federal government this year. So we're hoping Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, uh, that that will instigate some actual meaningful change. One thing I want to talk about, because I, I do see a lot of misinformation or disinformation from the media. What kind of role do you see the media playing in the mechanisms of change? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, it can be very, very damaging if they're playing into this polarizing culture. So I would say, first of all, it's the media we need to learn how to work with complexity to understand that, because a lot of journalists and what they do, and not just journalists, it's also, of course, social media, they're trying to reduce complexity in the narrative because complex stories don't sell. So they're trying to reduce it by creating black and white scenarios, uh, only highlighting one element and forgetting the rest. And I think that's very, very dangerous. You know, I read uh, once a beautiful article from a journalist who actually did a training in complexity thinking and learned how to bring out these different subtleties so that the media, in his writing at least, in his reporting, it was helping people to understand all the different challenges and how that is interrelated and, and not to just zoom in onto one aspect. The other thing about the media, of course, is especially now, check your facts, check your sources, yes. you know, <laughs> this, yeah, this whole idea of false information is unbelievable. Yeah, the yeah. idea of alternative facts. 
I think yes, exactly. It's like oh. and it's just not really how that works. Is no, if it's no. actual, factual, so, like <laughs> yes, yes. And for media, um, start documenting and communicating and spreading as much as you can the good news stories. Let people know where on the ground change is happening in a good direction. Give stories also that inspire, that that warm your heart. A lot of people have media fatigue. You know, they are so yeah. tired of one crisis and after another. I think one of the most dangerous things if we're going into times of challenges and crisis is numbness. Because when we are numbing ourselves, we are basically in a state of shutting down. Uh, and when you're shutting down, you, you are not able to access your capacities for transformational change, for advocacy. And the media is playing also a direct role in that fatigue that people are feeling in the sense of overwhelm. Make visible where the change is happening. Acknowledge and celebrate the people who are making a difference. Document their stories. And I still find um, myself as well when I work with the media, how challenging it is to get those stories through. Tragedies and things like that, they draw more attention. That's probably an issue because most people want something happy. And also, if you can show people how other people are doing things, then they can model themselves on that. Because I think that that kind of model is what's the missing for a lot of people is you know it, it's okay to look and go okay i know i need to change i recognize that but i'm not seeing other people doing it and being the first person to do something it tends to be a bit scary because you don't know exactly if you're doing it right spotlighting those stories could have like this real follow-on effect where more people start to emulate that and it inspires bigger change so that would be great <laughs> to see in the media, I think. That does actually bring me to another point that it is easier to, to spot problems in our systems. Um, and it's, it's harder to come up with solutions, particularly effective ones, ones that aren't just swapping out one bad thing for another. So, um, and you of course have worked on instigating societal change. So what kind of methods have you found to be most effective? Not just one, but again, a combination of different uh, methods. So one of them was to have work to create, for example, an education for sustainability programs for secondary and primary schools in Mauritius yeah? to make other kinds of educational systems um, available, uh, helping uh, schools to create a school garden, school project, um, develop ecological literacies and competencies, uh, actively trained a lot of teachers in, in systems thinking, system dynamics, always with, with a, a multiple of different methods and strategies. On the one hand, education. On the other hand, working also with uh, the development of new governance systems and now working with a, a global platform called Haifa and Seeds. Seeds is for developing the new regenerative currencies and um, also new governance systems, peer-to-peer uh, -peer. Haifa is a, is a platform globally for developing the new DAOs, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations where we're working on Web3 technologies and tools. So giving more people more voice and more ways of coordinating their capacities, their potentials, and also resources. I've worked on the development also with R3.0, uh, for example, on new blueprints. And this was a blueprint for educational transformation. So to help people through seven uh, essential learning perspectives and how that can be implemented. And so I've, I've worked really from, you know, from many different directions because again, it is a systems change is, is never yeah, just one it, thing. It's complicated. So you've got to change like, a bunch of things together it's sort of you can't just focus on yes thing, which is hard i've been training people for more than 20 years to develop their own stewardship capacities their custodianship capacities and also going through deep personal transformations rites of of passage um to ask those deeper questions of facilitated a lot of different dialogues also to get different multi-stakeholder dialogues, which also served as inputs for the SDGs for people to develop a shared vision. But I would, I would think really that maybe the most important strategy I have found across all of this um, is shared visioning to for people to really 
explore together what is this vision of a world where we say, yes, this, this is a world where my humanity counts, where I feel I can make a difference, where I feel that's the world where I feel at home. And, and then also to get for people to really clear, but well, this is that direction. Yeah, we have to make sure that we, we stop that uh, because um, that's that trajectory of collapse, of extinction. And for people to understand that doesn't have to be our future. That is one possible scenario if we don't do anything and we are we are just letting it all slip through our hands because we are not trusted enough, our capacities, our human capacities to truly rise up to the challenge and become the change that is needed. That sounds um, like a really good approach to, yeah, have people work together and collaborate. I think people get bogged down in terminology you probably saw recently the overturning of Roe vs Wade in the US which had a, a lot of outcry and it's very difficult because for a lot of people it's a very emotional issue it's hard to sort of talk to people around that when they get really bogged down in this specific thing is bad and so I can't accept that but when you talk about what kind of outcome what kind of world that you're living in then you can go okay well here are the ways you know, here are the positive steps that you can take to achieve that. Do you have any thoughts around that? Roe versus Wade, if you're looking at it, I find it unbelievable that judges are politically appointed. You know, it's, the issue starts again there if you take a systemic approach. To me, judges, they should never have that political yeah. affiliation and that much power. To me, there's something structurally wrong in, in the legal system. So I just want to, to bring that up first. Uh, because this, it's not just Roe versus Wade. After that, we, of course, we had the ruling against the EPA being able to have the powers and the means to to take the decisions that are necessary. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, exactly. So it's just across the line, you see, the legal arm always had to be the arm that really served as a, a balancing of powers. Um, and in, instead, uh, it, it's now being just a play ball of, of political forces and ideologies. And I think that this is just incredible so yeah we really need to <laughs> yeah Again, I mean, my... it, it seems yeah. to represent a real division between like the will of the actual people and the yes. systems and mechanisms that are in place there was no popular base support indeed um you know across the line people were not in favor of this ruling um and in america we're seeing again the it's one issue after another the increasing violence as well um, yeah. So there you can really see how a society is going into quite an advanced stage of self-destruction and becoming more and more polarized and divided. And this is why on the on one hand, it's driving change for different governance institutions and adjustments of many of the constitutions as well. The different role envisioning also for legal systems and not just punitive um, but much more as an a enabling regulating capacities for, for driving systems change. So it's it's a, a full view of understanding for, for where we are going now. We're not in normal times. We are in crisis times. It is getting worse, the issues. It requires a different kind of leadership, a visionary leadership, courage, but it also requires understanding the consequence of actions but it means such a huge transformation of many of existing institutions across the board. I think that it's a big challenge and I certainly hope that we're up to the task and that situations like, you know, the, the increased violence and divide in the US can be resolved in hopefully a, a peaceable way that they can find solutions. There have been many solutions, but they're categorically being undermined. And and this is, again, where let's bring it back again to ourselves. What can we each do? I think this is really important. So first of all, be well informed, learn about, about the issues, but continue to trust in your own humanity. How can you be an inspiration for change? Even as small as in your own local community. Yeah? I always like to say, for example, if you if you go to the bakery, <laughs> how are you showing up there? Are you smiling? Are you asking? How are you doing? Uh, taking an interest in the in the person there who is serving you this beautiful bread that's just been made. Yeah? It starts as simple as that. When a lot of violence 
comes in cultures of isolation, in cultures of uh, distrust, and cultures of polarization. But we are creating, co-creating these cultures together in how we show up. So we have much more powers as humans, each and every one of us, than we may realize. And it starts about how am I showing up in life itself? How am I relating to people? How am I reaching out? How am I supporting and facilitating possible solutions in my own neighborhoods and communities? And then also, you mentioned before that sometimes people are scared to pioneer because they're asking themselves, am I doing it right? Yeah. Well, when you're pioneering, there is no right or wrong. It's experimentation. It's understanding that in, in an attitude of experimentation, it, we're not looking at, oh, I want to make sure it, it, it fits in or it's being acceptable, it's going to be like. Those questions don't help. It's about, let's explore it together. Let's experiment different ways. Let's see how we can do this. I like to, to always ask that question, well, what if we could? Instead of, well, no, we won't, you know. <laughs> so what if we could? Yeah, what if, yeah we could? If, if we could. Like, I suppose it's, it's about if you are pioneering if you've got good intentions if you find your best and you trying to make positive change and you're willing to learn from mistakes that you learn about i think that that's yes. the best way yes. to go forward exactly and reaching out to each other letting other people know of what you're doing you know if you have a yeah. new project that you want to have support for you know let people know about your ideas and enter into conversations so we often think that, oh, that's a change. It's so big <laughs> out there. And then people feel overwhelmed. Yeah, but little changes that line up with other little changes from the people around us and that become coherent can become a tipping point for social change. Well, that's lovely. I think that is actually all we have time for today. So thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for the wonderful questions and all the great work you're doing. <laughs>